Well, hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you this month's installment of the E4C 2018 webinar series, where we'll be covering a virtual demo of the toolbox on solar-powered irrigation systems. My name is Jana Aranda, and I'm the president at E4C. I'm very pleased to be moderating today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and E4C's YouTube channel. Both of the URLs for those channels are listed on this slide. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinars team. The um, contact information is webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of these challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leadership, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C platform, the better we will be able to serve you resources that are aligned to your needs. For more information, please see our website and sign up. Now, there's a, I wanted to share with you an exciting announcement. So there's a real struggle when it comes to finding technical information about products developed for and used by those living in resource-constrained environments. Data is often scarce, biased, or inaccurate. These information gaps have had a number of consequences. For example, lessons, a loss of lessons learned and consequent reinvention of the wheel, challenges in assessing performance and scalability, ineffective implementation of technologies, and lack of transparency and accountability for poor quality or even worse, unsafe products entering the market. In 2012, E4C took on this challenge and started co-designing a resource with our community of engineering and global development experts. What we built is our solutions library. We applied human-centered design and tested multiple prototypes with a growing early adopter community. Today, we are very happy to announce that the Solutions Library is now launched as an E4C member benefit. E4C members can now access the Solutions Library with a single sign-on. It's as easy as registering for a webinar. What you see now is an example of one of the products in the Solutions Library. This is Future Pump's solar-powered irrigation pump. We thought it might be very relevant for today's conversation. The information included in the product report includes neutral market and engineering data, side-by-side -side comparisons with competitor technologies and user insights. We work with leading organizations such as the World Health Organization, COST, and others to identify products for inclusion. Data is sourced by our global cohort of research fellows and reviewed by a multidisciplinary network of expert advisors. We invite you to explore hundreds of technologies across a variety of sectors, discover innovations, suggest products for future integration, share your field experiences, and uncover new opportunities through the Solutions Library. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. We'd like to practice using the WebEx platform by, telling, uh, by sharing with us where you are in the world. In the chat window, which should be located in the middle right of your screen, please type in your location. I'll go ahead and get us started. All right. Let's see. So I'm joining from New York. All right. 
we see you folks from Germany, New York. All right. Okay, if you don't see your chat window, try clicking the chat icon in the bottom middle portion of your screen. You can use this window to share remarks during the webinar, and if you have technical questions, just send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. So uh, thank you for joining us. We see more folks coming in here from Washington and other locations. Um, now, for us to really, during the webinar, keep track of the questions, please use the Q&A window which should be located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see this window, click the Q&A icon in the bottom middle portion of the screen. It may be hidden in the circle with the three dots. All right. So we have folks uh, joining us from all over the world today, London, Germany, the United States. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, hopping on today. All right, if you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. So E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To, re to request your professional development hour, please follow the instructions on top of the E4C professional development page after the presentation. You may also go to your member dashboard and see information there on how to get those hours. Okay, thank you everyone for your replies. All right, so with that, I'd like to take a moment to tell you a bit more about today's webinar and our presenter. Thanks to significant advancements in solar tech and plummeting costs, solar generation now rivals established fuel technologies as a cleaner, more economical choice. There is exponential growth in solar technology adoption, particularly among the 1.2 billion people worldwide without access to electricity. By mid-2015, more than 89 million people in Africa and Asia owned at least one solar-powered product, and off-grid solar sales are projected to reach $3.1 billion U.S. by 2020. Solar irrigation products have emerged with the promise of helping subsistence and small-scale farmers improve productivity. Solar irrigation service providers, in turn, advisors, and practitioners invest significant time and effort to guide end users and other stakeholders in minimizing risks related to system efficiency, financial viability, and the unsustainable use of water. Today, we're very pleased to share the new Toolbox on Solar Powered Irrigation System intended to make the jobs of these organizations and individuals easier. We are joined by Robert Schultz, who is the advisor for Powering Agriculture, uh, as supported by the German International Development Organization, GIZ. Robert has spent the last two decades working on numerous initiatives related to renewable energy and rural development, working in family business and solar pumping systems in his home country of Namibia in the late 1990s. He developed an understanding of why technology succeed or fail in the, sea, in the field, which as we all actually know, has, often has nothing to do with the tech itself. Robert established a Namibia Renewable Energy Network, which transformed into the Namibian Energy Institute by the late 2000s supporting renewable energy activities on behalf of the government. He spent time in the consulting industry developing rural electrification programs and in NGOs implementing programs ranging from fuel-efficient cook stoves to large-scale biomass power generation and from solar cell phone charging to Africa's largest solar hybrid mini-grid. He undertook number, numerous awareness-raising activities and conceptualized and constructed off-road energy trailers to take a message to schools in deep rural areas. We are so thrilled to have Robert join us today and share some of his insights and take you all to this virtual demo. And with us, I'll turn it over to Robert. Wow, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the, I hope you can all hear me. Loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you, Jana, for that, <laughs> speaking into, uh, into a vacuum. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we're actually doing this via a landline telephone, which is the first time in a very long time. One gets so used to the fast um, development of technology that one forgets that only, what, uh, 10 years ago we used fax machines. Well, thank you very much for, for attending and very, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to present to you the Toolbox on Solar Powered Irrigation Systems, SPIS for short. Um, my name is Robert Schulz. I am GIZ advisor for the GIZ project Sustainable Energy for Food 
uh, powering agriculture. Essentially, what we do is we support energy innovations that improve agricultural value chains. So it's not just a matter of uh, supporting the energy innovation in terms of pilot projects and uh, prototype development, but also looking at value chains themselves. Often there are key opportunities hidden in value chains that are not immediately apparent. So through this process, we acquire uh, an enormous amount of knowledge, which we then um, reconceptualize and repackage so that we can cater for the needs of various stakeholders and actually share the lessons learned. And more often than not, much of this knowledge then requires some kind of skills development in order to actually be replicated. Now we have some we have uh, a focal areas that we work within. So we have a broad area called solar processing, which looks at solar operated oil presses, for instance, or uh, different types of uh, passive solar drying technologies. We, have, we are quite passionate about green cooling, um, uh, specifically solar ice making, but also solar cold rooms. We have a fair amount of experience in energy efficiency. This is more large scale, specifically in the tea sector and the dairy sector. And then, of course, solar pumping, where the technology is relatively mature, but there are so many different types around. Uh, I, I liken it to the Wild West. Um, new innovations popping up uh, every other day. There are not yet uh, clear guidelines and standards and specifications, which is an, an ideal ground for, for innovators. But of course, also an opportunity to, for us to um, yeah, add some, some, uh, some decision-making support to this new realm. So why solar pumping? Um, essentially, it's a very beautiful nexus uh, technology. Nexus implying it combines water, energy, and food very neatly. Um, and it is an extremely attractive, as Iana mentioned earlier, the market is booming. Um, India, for instance, has a program to launch the installation of 18 million pumps. Uh, over the last, I think it's five years alone, they went from 1,000 pumps to 40,000 pumps. So there's a huge, huge um, market developing for solar powered pumping. It's a clean technology at the surface of it. Um, and it, we can definitely assume that the technology will go from strength to strength, specifically with uh, module prices declining further. But that, of course, raises a number of issues. And we've have had numerous examples of poorly planned and executed systems uh, not only when it came to system sizing, uh, having oversized systems or undersized systems, but essentially also poorly planned in terms of the actual installation. Robert, poorly installed. Uh, yes. So sorry to interrupt for a moment. Just making sure that uh, you are able to share your screen, just in case you are sharing some information through your own laptop. Um, ah, fantastic. Apologies for the interruption, everyone. We know that uh, Robert has a really uh, great slides and the demo. I think this was just a um, in the in the it's momentum. A <laughs> problem. <laughs> just uh, as too many platforms, you have the live call combined with a digital platform. So, and for those this. of you who are listening to us on uh, the the webinar remotely, please do feel free to uh, select. Uh, all attendees in your chat replies, so that way uh, if you are uh, making comments that you would like others to see that they are able to do so. Great. Jana, just help me out quickly. Uh, I'll do this via share and then my screen, screen two. Um, there you go. It's, it looks like it's coming up. Voila. We are seeing it right now. Lovely, lovely. Um, Fantastic. So this is Yes, if you can make it to, if you want to present right now, it is in the regular view. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you for pointing that out to me, you know, with, between all the clicks. 
fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we enjoy Great. reading your bio thoroughly, but I think this is a over bit more Over and compelling. over and over again. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. My apologies, colleagues, for, for that uh, technical mishap. You know, that's, um, a, yeah, a fax machine generation. Um, great. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, backtrack slightly for the benefit of a recollection. Um, I mentioned earlier powering agriculture and the work that we do in terms of supporting innovations that strengthen energy aspects in agricultural value chains. Uh, so we don't only support the innovations themselves through pilot projects and uh, demonstration developments and uh, prototype construction, but also looking at value chain assessments, understanding value chains better, sharing the knowledge that we have acquired, and then developing skills programs and, uh, and uh, training programs that can actually lead to replication of the knowledge. And the toolbox on solar-powered irrigation falls into that category. I mentioned briefly the solar processing expertise that we have, our experience with green cooling, energy efficiency, and that brings us to solar pumping, and this is where the slides become more interesting and uh, visual as well. So sorry for keeping that from you. So this is a nice example of a large scale, relatively large scale, two kilowatt system in India. Um, there are numerous of such installations, large and small, uh, all over the world increasingly. Um, but as I've mentioned, we are noticing a number of critical aspects in terms of poorly planned systems. Uh, this example here shows the very um, uh, basic assumption that you would anchor the solar panel array solidly on a concrete block, but that is not a given. Um, and you find many systems where, where system collapse is imminent simply because the planning was not done properly. The same also applies to poorly installed systems, not only above ground like here with um, poor cabling, uh, lack of earthing, but also below ground with wells not properly uh, protected from siltation, then resulting in mud pumping, which uh, every pump absolutely loves. We have poorly maintained systems. Just because a solar module is low maintenance does not imply it is no maintenance. Um, and that requires sensitization uh, amongst users to be aware that also systems that, um, that are essentially can be left alone to, to a large extent need some care and attention. Um, the thing with solar systems is a little bit that they are counterintuitive or not as intuitive. Uh, when a community is used to a diesel pump, then uh, it is very clear that when the pump makes noise, it is working, and if it is silent, it is not working. And with a solar system, it's the other way around. If it makes noise, then it's obviously not working. So there's a huge trust component that needs to be developed when it comes to this type of technology. We are also very uh, keenly aware of the det possible detrimental environmental impact that this technology might have specifically relating to the rebound effect, which implies that when pumping is for free, users will overexploit a resource, which then leads to environmental degradation, such as decreased um, water table, uh, siltation and, er and erosion of underground water systems, um, salinification and the uh, drawing of, of salts from nearby coastal areas, then, of course, ultimately loss in water quality and soil, ero uh, soil erosion, topsoil losses, etc. So that is something we definitely have to deal with when it comes to promoting this technology. Because all of these things, system failures, environmental degradation, will ultimately have an impact on the farm economy and uh, just add to the um, to the challenges that rural community already face and increasingly face in the 
in the view of climate change impacts. And that, by and large, leads to a break in trust. Trust in the technology, which already we are trying to build up, or pioneers in the technology have built up over decades, can actually be, uh, become redundant very, very quickly. Especially also if uh, fly-by-night sell um, um, low-quality systems. Great. So when it comes to the toolbox on solar-powered irrigation systems, in a nutshell, we essentially had a challenge to address. And that was the lack of holistically trained advisors on SPIS. Holistically implies not only advisors that can install a system and know how to connect a controller and do series or parallel wiring and how to lower a pump into a, into a borehole or a well. These trainings are, are plentiful, but trainings that also consider the environmental aspects and the economic and financial aspects, specifically going as, de as deep as looking into the profitability of a farming enterprise and actually advising a farmer closer on how they can improve their farming system, on how they can improve their irrigation system. So we set out to strengthen the uh, advisory services around various SPAS aspects through very brief information and then hands-on tools, practical tools with the objective to support informed decision-making on SBIS and with a target group ranging from technology providers. It is my personal ambition that technology providers will move beyond merely selling a technology, but actually grooming their market and, um, and, train or, and, and advising uh, uh, farmers and end users and become a resource and not just a, a sales agent. Um, then definitely trainers uh, of, and agricultural extensionists, development practitioners, because they often have much greater um, interest in ensuring that a system works, and then financial institutions, because sooner or later it bo does boil down, or, or sooner or later it is um, a critical aspect um, in terms of obtaining funding for the technology. We've tested the toolbox in early developmental trainings in Mali, Ghana, and India back in 2016, and we conducted a number of trial trainings in Germany, Chile, and Rwanda last year, and the toolbox was officially launched together with the FAO in, uh, in March in March of this year. So our guiding principles are that the toolbox is open access, open source, and open for adaptation. And on that note, we've, everything is essentially downloadable through this online platform that we like using called Energypedia. I'm not sure how many of you are already familiar with it. It's a huge resource um, on all kinds of energy topics that uh, GIZ, amongst others, uh, uses to actually disseminate energy-related information. And it essentially, it's the, the box in toolbox. There we go, that's the box. So it's an online platform through which you can access these tools and use them offline. So you download them. We specifically looked at creating something that is not dependent on internet connectivity all the time, um, and that uses essentially a software that is uh, available to most. Now, within the toolbox, we have two, two different types of items. We have modules. These are text documents, around about 20 pages. We try to be as uh, concise as possible on various topics. And these modules, in turn, are supported by tools, primarily um, Excel-based spreadsheet tools. So if we um, just take a broad look at the type of tools within the toolbox, 
and modules. We have uh, modules around the preconditions. Two modules, get informed and safeguard water. Get informed and assist in understanding the technology itself and all the intricacies that, that involve the technology. And safeguard water looks at the water and irrigation aspects. So um, it's the S and the I, solar and irrigation. We have tools and modules around planning. Um, on a macro level, we would be looking at promote and initiate. This has to do with a government or a donor or non-governmental organization with the ambition of launching an SPIS program within their country. What is it that they should be cognizant of? What should they investigate? Uh, what are the um, major critical factors? And then on a more micro level, we have the design. This is looking at designing uh, in terms of system sizing, but also um, understanding the site conditions that are, that are prevalent that need to be considered in your planning. We have tools around the aspects of economics. Specifically, the INVEST tool is of interest because it looks at the parameters important to a financial service provider. We have, for instance, a tool that would allow you to, do, to um, uh, compile a farm income statement or to do a payback assessment between different technologies. And these type of outputs from the tools would be essential when it comes to fulfilling the requirements of a loan application. So this is very useful for financial service providers to make this a prerequisite for their uh, SPIS loans. And then we have aspects around management. From the setup, the, uh, how to arrange your, entire, your structure around solar powered irrigation systems, um, issues around irrigation, how to establish a irrigation schedule, for instance, uh, depending on soil type, and maintain how to regularly maintain your, um, your infrastructure and establish a maintenance routine. So, if you were to open the toolbox, you would see essentially something like this. Uh, a large navigation block uh, with smaller blocks in between. Each of these blocks, the smaller ones, are modules. In case you're wondering, our favorite color is green. And in order to demonstrate that this is indeed what you would see, I will click on this hyperlink up above, and we will now move out of a PowerPoint-based presentation to something a little bit more interactive. There we go. This is the toolbox with a large navigation bar at the top. This bar accompanies you throughout your navigation experience uh, of the toolbox, so you can go back and forth between different modules. Beneath it, we have uh, links to abbreviations, simply because I keep forgetting what GIWR stands for. We have a glossary of terms, because I keep forgetting what NPV and MPPT stands for. We have an interesting uh, section on training, which I will share with you in a short while. We have downloads, which allows you to download all the tools separately and all the modules separately or everything together in one go. Right now, we only have English versions, but by the end of the year, we will have French and Spanish versions of the toolbox as well. Contacts, if you need to get in touch with us um, and have very specific questions or ha happen to spot a mistake. And then a password link. All the tools we use are password protected, not because we want to be proprietary and secretive, but simply because um, some, uh, some users might feel intimidated by, by Excel. Excel, for me personally, is the, the best software in the world, or spreadsheet software, let me rather call it that. I like um, you know, ones and zeros. Um, 
but not everybody has the same passion. And there's a good general fear out there that, oh, no, I made a mistake. And um, in order to avoid this, we've protected the sheets and only unprotected the entry cells. But you can, of course, open the, the spreadsheet up, uh, unlock hidden files, and really delve into the assumptions, formulas, and background data used. Great. And now we go back to our start page. So on our start page, scrolling further down, here's another way of presenting the modules. This gives you a very quick overview as to the content. So you don't have to click your way into the module itself. You can click here, and, and it says that the Get Info module provides essential information for agricultural advisors and financial service providers to understand the operating principles of solar-powered irrigation systems and to, and to differentiate between the individual system components. If you click onto a tool, uh, a module like Safeguard Water, it also describes the tools that are associated to this module. So right now we have uh, nine modules online, um, and a tenth is uh, soon to follow the market assessment tool, which assists companies in assessing whether there is a market for solar-powered irrigation systems in a specific country. But still on the start page, there are two resources I want to share with you that uh, are uh, supplements and complementary to the toolbox. This is an A0 poster, which essentially summarizes the key aspects around solar-powered irrigation systems. From the planning approach, what is um, evapotranspiration, what is the total dynamic head, to the effects on groundwater pumping, um, to certain preconditions that have to be met. You need to have a certain solar resource. You need to have a water resource. Um, the management aspects, ranging from the installation quality to theft prevention measures, we have an overview of the components and how they all link and interact with each other, ranging from the solar system, the solar modules, all the way to the irrigation system. And we have a section on the economics, which essentially is primarily twofold. Is the farm profitable? Is there sufficient income from the farm to undertake an SPIS investment? And is an SPIS investment the right choice in terms of technology, uh, possibly a grid-connected con grid pump or even, lo and behold, a diesel-connected pump, a uh, diesel-powered pump might be a better economic choice. So these are freely downloadable and, uh, and printable on, uh, on a plotter. We have another similar poster, which is a flow diagram. Looking at your decision-making process uh, when it comes to investing in an SPIS. Of course, starting with your basic conditions on site, with your slope, soil type, uh, the cropping patterns and the type of crops then moving to your irrigation type and water resource type, all the way down to economic viability. And when you've passed through this, this um, little um, uh, labyrinth, you will finally get, to an idea, get an idea of whether at your SPIS is viable or not. If it's not, you start at the top again and try and figure out where did I take a wrong route. So also a lovely resource. Um, and I think in terms of uh, pinning these posters up in company waiting rooms, for instance, would be a great contribution to the discussion that companies can, for instance, make to, um, to solar pumping. Perfect. I hope you're still with me. Um, I want to share with you briefly what a module looks like. 
let's go and, for instance, take the maintenance module. The main, all the modules are in properly formatted PDF versions as well. But in terms of the electronic version, you receive um, an introduction and then chapters that are all individually hyperlinked. So we, tr we want to avoid a lot of scrolling down on small screens. So when you click onto um, information that it's more or less contained um, uh, on, one, on one page. And I choose an example where it's on two pages. <laughs> so if I, for instance, click here and I go to want to have a look at a tool, let's take the maintenance checklist, I get to a download page, I would click download, I would open it, and I will have a Excel tool called Maintenance Checklist. Now, in terms of the types of tools that we have, we have these checklists. Um, we have templates that can be used for report writing. We also have templates that are useful for record keeping. By way of example, if you um, have a record sheet of your water infrastructure, when it was installed, what the water delivery is, what type of pump is installed on it, have you observed any environmental um, proxy, as, uh, any indicators of environmental degradation in terms of uh, proxy indicators? Um, and all of that on a, on a sheet that can then be periodically completed, for instance, by an agricultural official. Um, and this way, one can keep track of the sites installed. And the last type of tools are analysis tools with relatively more uh, complex formulas in the background. In this particular case, we have the maintenance tool, which looks at um, some general issues. Does the farm have uh, the contact details for the technician or other service uh, support services? Yes or no. Um, our farm name or other identification marks painted on the back of the sheet of each PV panel still clearly readable, etc. So you would systematically uh, work your way through these uh, the checklist items. Is the reservoir, reservoir flushed regularly? Um, is the water in the reservoir clear from, from algae? Are there leakages, etc.? And this is something a farmer would then do every six months, and this way I can observe, yes, I actually have a very, um, a very good system. Good. Now, I've mentioned earlier uh, the training uh, hyperlink. The training link is designed to assist trainers and provide them with materials that they can use during the training sessions. So we would, for instance, have pictures of components uh, and also workmanship and maintenance. If I, for instance, click on here, we get a fair amount of pictures of systems that have been damaged. Um, this is, for instance, a controller that has been flooded. Or we have an example here of um, how you can actually, a very efficient way of protecting your modules from theft. Um, we have come up with all kinds of complicated uh, systems and uh, barbed wire and high uh, fencing, but uh, one of the the uh, the best success factors we've come across is the simple spray painting of solar modules on the backside using epoxy paint or something similar that hardens. It's uh, it, nearly impossible to wash off, and it reduces the resale value of the module instantly. So instantly, the module is, uh, has an owner. It is no longer 
uh, anonymous and becomes uh, less attractive to thieves. We have other resource materials that we call display materials. These are statistics that, we, that are related to SPIS that we found very relevant on a, on a, um, in a, within a training context. For instance, I can share this one here with you. It shows the changes in female share of economically active population in agriculture, uh, essentially uh, per continent, Africa, Asia, Western Asia, and Latin America. And as can be clearly seen, the female sh share is increasing everywhere. So if I am a company, I should be aware that my customer base will be female and I should actually devise my support and also marketing around catering for these specific needs. Uh, the, the future of food security globally will, will uh, rest with women increasingly. So for me, that is something that is an important parameter to consider when we discuss large-scale SBIS programs. We have to be cognizant of this. Here's another one I find a little, uh, quite telling. Um, it shows the distribution of food losses and waste along the supply chain. And if we take sub-Saharan Africa, which, uh, which is where I am from, we can see that most losses occur on harvest side and then post-harvest. And this harvest element is largely due to a lack of regular irrigation, the impact of drought, but also, of course, the impact of uh, pests, etc. cetera. Um, while the food wastage on consumption level is minor. So you go to Europe and you will see that their food wastage and loss is not that far below that of sub-Saharan Africa, but their largest proportion is food wastage at consumption level. That is essentially when you have all your systems are relatively efficient, but you have a population that um, has no respect for food. We also have what we call country case cards. And these are case studies that we have collected, uh, one from Chile and one from Kenya which looks at a specific scenario and then uses the tools to evaluate that scenario. So the case card represents the, the story um, and the tools are then related to the data, uh, incorporate the data in that story and show you how the tools are used. So, and on that note, I will now move um, to a tool, I will go directly to um, a folder I have here. Let me see to show you how one of the tools would, uh, how a tool would work. I'm taking one of our flagship tools. Which is the water requirement tool. The rationale behind this is that when a client goes to a solar company, the solar company will typically ask how much water is in the borehole and according to that data, design the system. When in fact, the question should be how much water do you need? And more often than not, people cannot really answer that question. So we would typically buy a pump that extracts as much water as possible and that would be a more expensive pump and overexploit the resource. So we have a very uh, a tool based on a number of FAO tools, but, uh, but radically simplified, that allows you to assess how much water a specific crop at a specific location would require. All of our tools start with a README sheet that uh, give you a basic overview of what it is that you are facing. And then a number of subsheets, um, some have 
calculations integrated into the individual sheet. Others have an input sheet and then an output sheet that summarizes the data. So let's have a look at water requirements. Geographic data sheet. I'm using the example of Kenya. Here are average mean daily temperature and average rainfall for Kenya. Um, there are these are two of the three parameters that are important in terms of a plant's water need. How high is the temperature determines the evapotranspiration rate. The rainfall determines how much water is available to the plant. And then hemisphere, the latitude, are important in terms of um, sunshine hours per day. So these are the hours that a plant has for photosynthesis and the uh, the active time that a plant or a crop has. We have hyperlinks inserted for external resources where you can obtain such type of data for your country. This is what you would enter. You would then go to the crop water requirement sheet, which looks a little bit daunting, but the basic approach to Excel is always start at the top. So starting at the top, we would say the area measurement unit in Kenya is acre. And that acre would then be as a, used as a unit throughout. It's, I think, 2.4 acres on a hectare. Then you determine, and from the graph below, you can see your rainfall data. These are the, this is the average rainfall pattern of Kenya with a larger rainy season and a smaller rainy season. I would now select from the drop-down list a, um, a type of crop. Um, the drop-down list is relatively extensive. We have, you know, we start with, uh, with, we end with wheat and we start with barley and have lots of uh, crops in between. Let's take cabbage. And in terms of the area of cabbage that we intend of, so by adding cabbage, I immediately get a second graph, which shows me the evapotranspiration rate for cabbage per month. This is the cubic meter water demand for, um, for cabbage in a particular month. If I type in the acre, one acre, I get a third graph, which is the water pumping requirement per day. The next one is the planting season. When do you, when do you start planting? I will show you a nifty feature around this in, shortly. The average growing time, minimum, maximum, or, or average, um, depending on the seed, seed type you have. Some seeds might germinate faster and have a faster growth cycle, so you say it has a minimum growing time. The irrigation scheme that you use, is it drip, is it micro sprinkler, is it flood irrigation, is it a traveling gun? Let's go for drip, that's always a good idea. Drip has a 90% efficiency, and you will go for normal spacing. You have three to choose from. Normal, double, or triple spacing. If you are not sure which spacing, uh, what, is the, what is a normal spacing, we've put a resource here for you to um, consider. So now instantly, you will get this green bar message, which says the highest daily irrigation water need per day is 24 cubic meters in the month of June in Kenya. The pump utilization rate is 22%. The yearly water need is 1,900 cubic meters. And now you can start planning. Because observing these green figures and observing the graphs below, by, by changing your planting state, you can influence the water requirements. So if I would decide, no, I want to plant closer to the rainy season, I went from 24 to 19 cubic meters in the month of May is now the highest month. And we've increased our pump utilization rate because the pump 
is can be smaller now than the original the, the the 24 cubic meters we had earlier. So we can now start optimizing our planting according to the seasons. I accept, of course, that there are other criteria as well in terms of planting. You might want to plant when there's when the price uh, or, or, or uh, harvest when the price is highest. So there are other factors to consider, but just uh, in terms of um, um, your geospatial parameters, this is a useful tool to use. If I change from drip to micro sprinklers, I would immediately increase my water demand. If I decide to add another crop, I would then influence my pump utilization rate. Pump utilization rate means that this investment works 25, uh, uh, 27% of the time. So it's one third. Two thirds of your investment stands idle for the rest of the year. And that is one reason why solar pumping makes such low uh, economic sense in many instances, especially when it comes to crop irrigation. But this can change if you, for instance, plant beans, one hectare, or one acre, at another time. Now we plant beans very much close to the time that we plant cabbage and immediately our water demand increases. But if we decide we want to plant it, uh, actually have a second season, I still have a high water demand, not as high as before, and I increase my pump utilization rate. And this can essentially then be manipulated and used for planning. We have a similar tool for livestock watering. It's a little bit it's simpler because livestock needs water every day, so it is not, doesn't have um, the, um, the planning intricacies as, as crops would have. We have a summary sheet, which is useful for printing out and sharing uh, for, uh, with, with uh, the client, or, or, or if the client uses it, if the farmer uses it, to share it with um, the technology supplier. And then we have a sheet on how this tool works. There are assumptions in the background related to evapotranspiration rates. Uh, we use the Blaney Criddle method, which is not as complex as methods that, uh, that would be used for intricate and uh, much more in-depth design. But the idea here is to give users and agriculturalists a sense of the critical parameters that, that affect water demand. Great. So, Jana, I have a second tool to share to just uh, breathe through. Is that, is that mm -hmm. good? Yes, if we can uh, breeze through it as quickly as possible, that would be great. So we can at least have uh, a few minutes for questions because we are coming to time. Yes. Okay. Thank this you. is this is this is this is easy. Uh, this is your payback tool. This is when does a uh, the investment? When do you have a return on investment? In this particular case, we have an input and an output sheet. Under input, I would have basic assumptions. Um, for instance, what is the inflation rate? Uh, what is the fuel price increase? Do I pay a water levy? What is my farm income? This you have calculated using the farm, in, uh, farm analysis tool. And how much, what proportion of that income do I plan on investing in my water infrastructure? So in this particular case, 50%. You would then add data around your solar-powered pump. In this particular case, we are actually lending some money for uh, uh, purchasing the pump. If you have a subsidy, you can add the value there. We are comparing it with a grid-powered irrigation system, um, prices for the system, but then, of course, you have higher operating costs for the, the grid electricity consumption. This you would calculate here which will then automatically give you, give you an idea of the type of CO2 emissions that, you, um, that result from your grid-based pumping. 
the grid emission factor can be obtained through another hyperlink. Similarly, if you want to use a diesel pump, you have operating expenses, and then you can see what is the CO2 emission in kilograms or tons per year for your diesel pump. So basic data that you would enter, and your output sheet summarizes everything. Your basic assumptions, your basic data for your solar pump, your basic data for the grid pump, and your basic data for the diesel pump. It provides you with graphs that give you the accumulated cash flow, internal rate of return, NPV, system lifecycle cost, the comparative uh, cash flow over 10 years, the average annual water cost, so you get an idea what does a cubic meter of water actually cost me. That is, this is all inclusive, so all your interest payments, your maintenance services, etc., would be factored into this. And then you get to compare this with um, your income and across the board with the other technologies. So from this graph, you could see the green line represents your income. It crosses the blue and the gray line almost at the same time, a year and a half, which means the payback for your grid and your diesel pump is after about a year. It crosses the orange line, the solar line, in year four and a half. So in year, in year four, you would have the payback on your solar system. You can also compare the different technologies to each other because here you can observe that in year six and a half, your diesel now becomes more expensive than your solar. And often because data is hidden when we only take a short planning horizon, we have a 25-year graph, which then also shows you that at some point in year 19, diesel, the diesel cost will have exceeded the income from your farm. So from the year 19, your diesel is costing you money, and hence you receive an error message up here that says, yes, for payback for diesel, no payback. And if there are too, many, too much data in here and you want to actually reduce some of it, you simply select and deselect, and you then get uh, uh, only uh, the data that you require. And that's it. Um, almost. Let me just jump back no, here with see. this. Perfect. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, as one of our attendees noted, uh, this is uh, precious information. So a very, very useful mm -hmm. insight and tool. And we thank you for taking us so thoroughly through um, the tool itself. So um, a couple of, of questions. And for those of you who are listening, please do enter your questions into the Q&A window. If you don't see it, it is located. Um, in the middle bottom of your screen, or if uh, you know you're having a struggle, just put it into the chat for now. Um, so we we have a couple of very uh, practical questions. Um, one question comes to us from Morocco. One of our listeners is Morocco, who has noted that most of the farmers in Morocco use uh, tinkered gas engines. I'm guessing what that means is that they've been altered. So the question is, can you confirm that uh, the use of uh, conventional electric pumps for solar pumping is, is considered here. Yes. So in the payback tool, if you opt to use a normal um, AC pump on, your solar, on a solar system, you would then need an inverter and you would add the cost of that inverter to the pumping technology, uh, to the pump. Okay, there you um, go. So also, very, hopefully you, that's, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's, it, yeah, it's, so it's variable for that. Also, if you decide, no, I actually don't, I'm don't, I don't want to use diesel, I want to use LPG, you can simply add the LPG data, write uh, LPG instead of diesel, and also select LPG for your CO2 emissions, and then all the graphs will compare solar to uh, LPG to, to gas engines. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope that it helps to answer the question. It's great that you guys have taken into account, obviously, the practicalities 
um, that are really the reality on the ground. Another question about the toolbox that is uh, particularly um, kind of uh, practical <laughs> is that uh, the posters that you shared, which I agree with, are, are, tr are truly a great visual way to, to look at and absorb the information. Um, is all of this information available in different sections of the toolbox visually or just in select areas? It's, uh, we've tried to make the toolbox in such a way that you never get lost. Um, so on the start page, we have uh, these posters, but then mm -hmm. under training, under display materials and posters, you will also find the posters. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. One more uh, practical note. So personally, for me as an engineer, I have to tell you it's an engineering dream to see that there is an Excel spreadsheet with a checklist for operation and maintenance. So thank you on behalf of the entire engineering community for thinking of that. Um, <laughs> one of our attendees uh, is also asking, are the Excel sheets that you presented, uh, um, can they be used for any project in any country dealing with solar pumping? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that's a, that was a, it, it's nice to have questions that are, one can answer with a resounding yes. Um, <laughs> uh, essentially, um, the technology is, is so universal, um, and many of the, the um, water aspects we, can, we actually understand are also univer can apply universally, and that's what we try to incorporate in the tools. So if you come mm -hmm. across something extremely unique in, in a country that is not currently accommodated in the tool, then we would love to find out about that and, and see whether we can build this into the tool. Brilliant. Um, so this is going to have to be the last question because we are at time. But this is, again, another question that is uh, uh, very specific. So for users that uh, have calculated the need uh, for the volume of water to be supplied per day, how do they go then about uh, selecting the type of pump or I guess a specific pump uh, that they may be able to install? And I'm going to also add to, to that some more. So please go, go for it, Robert, if you can address that. Initially, we started um, an analyzing using very specific pump types and models. We've mm -hmm. moved away from it and started uh, now system sizing tool giving ranges, recommending ranges of uh, installed PV capacities instead of mentioning specific pump names. Reason is twofold. The market is developing so fast, there are new products uh, on the market all the time. And secondly, um, that the current, the current front runners in the market are developing their products at a continuous basis. So that would imply we would incorporate an element that needs very frequent updating and also would expose us to, you know, possibly wrong recommendations or, or excluding other innovators in the space. And that's what we wanted to avoid. So we don't make a recommendation on a pump. If you want to find out who in my country is selling pumps, we have a tool that, a little guide that says, okay, how many pump manufacturers are there in your country? And then you would actually do this small micro assessment open up a telephone book uh, and or do web searches and identify the, the pump, the technology providers. You can then use the tools to double check the system sizing recommendations that a pump uh, provider then makes. Fantastic. So if a pump provider and wants to sell you a two kilowatt pump and your, our system sizing tell you, tells you it's a one kilowatt pump, then you have grounds to be suspicious. Indeed. And uh, to build on that, um, actually, uh, we shared this in, earlier in the webinar, but um, you can find uh, a variety of pumps, examples of pumps that are available on the market in the Engineering for Change Solutions Library. So combining the tool and the outputs of the tool with also the guide uh, from um, the Energypedia resources, uh, you may be able to select at least a few examples of existing organizations, uh, companies that are selling pumps, and uh, then uh, have a much better competitive analysis as you look to purchase a pump for your project or program. So um, with that, I, I would like to thank you, Robert, 
uh, for joining us today. We are we are so grateful for this uh, fantastic tour of the tool and excited to uh, use uh, the tool ourselves and certainly share the tool with um, our community. Um, I would like to thank all of you uh, for attending today from all around the world. Uh, we are thrilled that you were able to join us today. Uh, please note that the we uh, webinar will be recorded and we will share the uh, recording after this. For those of you seeking your professional development hours, please do uh, submit uh, the form that's available on uh, the professional development page and also in your membership database um, with the PH code listed on this slide. If we didn't address your questions, please feel free to email us and we'll forward them accordingly. And if you are not an EPRFC member, do sign up so we can send you invitations to upcoming webinars directly to your inbox. With that, I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you may be. And we look forward to seeing you on the next Engineering for Change webinar. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,